Call the roll, please. Waters. Here. Moore. Here. O'Kane. Here. Shainer. Here. Scott. Here. Could we stand for a moment of silent prayer followed by a pledge of allegiance, please? Can you meet me at the mic, please? I'm fine, thank you. We have a proclamation that reads, whereas the United States was founded upon the principle that all people are created with an inalienable right to freedom, and the 13th Amendment was added to the Constitution making slavery illegal. And whereas slavery within the United States today is the most often found in the form of forced labor and sex trafficking, which weakens our social fabric, increases violence and organized crime, and debases our humanity. And where every business, community, organization, faith community, family, and individual can make a difference by choosing products that are not made by forced labor, by working to protect our young people from sexual exploitation, by addressing the problems of the internet sex trafficking and pornography pornography, and by becoming more aware of the problem and possible solutions. Now, therefore, I, Robert E. Scott, Mayor of the City of Sioux City, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim January 2024 as Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month and encourage our citizens to become more familiar with the problems and to work towards solutions. I'd like to present that to you in a few words, if you would. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Actually, I have some good news that I'd like to share with you. Um, we are seeing some real progress in the area of prevention of human trafficking. Um, when we have tables at events, we have a wheel that the kids get to spin, and then they, whatever color they get, they get an age-appropriate question. And they're more and more, they know what we're talking about. Um, they're better informed on what they should and shouldn't do. The parents have become more involved. I think at first, there was just so much that they were overwhelmed. So the parents will say, thank you for reinforcing what we've been saying, or not tell me how, you know, what I should know about this. So we're very encouraged by that. Um, we also are very happy uh, to thank the police. They've made real progress this past year. Uh, they've joined uh, an Iowa agency, and they're uh, partnering with the uh, federal agencies. Uh, and they are, they are working on prevention as well as getting the bad guys. Um, it's hard and it's a long grind for prevention, but it's so much better than having to try to get somebody out of trafficking and try to restore their lives. So that, that's really good news. And the uh, Sioux City Human Rights Commission is uh, co-sponsoring a presentation on Thursday night at the um, Public Museum from 6 to 8, uh, along with the Sioux Line Coalition Against Human Trafficking. And so we want to make sure that anybody who is interested will come. Uh, they also are providing it Facebook, uh, live on their Facebook page, on the Human Rights Commission Facebook page. So, um, we, you know, we just appreciate the city's support and want you to know, you know, everybody's plodding along and we're making some progress. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your work. Keep up the good work. Thank you. We'll go to interviews. Environmental Advisory Board, Alex Johnson. Alex, please come to the microphone and tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to serve, please. <clears throat> Uh, Alex Johnson, 33 years old, owner of Proper Painting. I was to be my second term on the Environmental Advisory Board. I believe in civic engagement and environmental stewardship. Questions? Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate you being up, no doubt. Human Rights Commission, Gary Lewis. Hi, kids. How are you? Good, how are you, everyone? Good. I'm Gary Lewis. Uh, I'll prefer to keep my age to myself. My second time being up in front of this august buddy and that body, and I'm <laughs> glad to be here. This is something I really want to be a part of. Uh, I was raised in a family that human rights was uh, very pivotal. Uh, my grandfather's a Presbyterian, Presbyterian minister. He did missionary work on the on the on the on the Indian tribe lands. My father did a lot of help, uh, work trying to help the tribes and uh, did marches, and I want to follow in that suit. I want to be uh, anywhere where human rights is being discussed. That's all. All good reasons. Thank you. Fair enough. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the application. Thank you. Appreciate it. Terry McGaffin. Hello. 
Hello, I'm Terry McGaffin, and I, like Mr. Lewis, I am applying to be on the board of the Human, I'm applying to be on the Human Rights Commission as a commissioner. Um, this is also my second time of, of uh, speaking to this august body uh, in applying for this position. Um, I applied in April um, and was not chosen. Um, like Gary, I have a strong interest in seeing uh, uh, to, I'm interested in ensuring uh, an equitable community, a fair and equitable community, and uh, seeking opportunities to, mm, to end discrimination in this community. Um, and I believe that that's also all I have to say, except that I guess I, I have a question. Um, since I did apply in April and was not chosen, does this body have any questions for me to address um, to make me better applicable to this position. How many openings do we have? Let me ask that first. I believe it is one due to a resignation. And, and does it have to be male or female? Could be either one. Could be either one, okay. Okay, so between me and Gary, you will make a decision. <laughs> no, you two no. go arm wrestle out in the hall, no, come no. back and let us know who won. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gary. All right, thank both of you. We appreciate it. Parking and Skywalk System Board of Trustees, Samuel Avery. Sam here? There he is. How are you, Mr. Avery? Doing fantastic. Well, How are go you? Ahead. Why, why do you want to keep going? Tell us. Well, I honestly just really enjoy this position. Uh, I've had two full terms on it so far, and so this would be going for a third. And I've been the chair of the of the advisory board for the last year. Uh, I just truly love, you know, just any anything that I, any input I can provide to help with the security of our people going through downtown Sioux City and making people feel safe. So that's part so, of why I love it. And uh, anyone's got any questions for me? Would we need to waive the rules in? Has he been two full terms? I was gonna note that technically your first part of your term was partial. So you still have a full second term. So he served a partial term. Okay, so we don't have term. waive rules. That's correct. That's okay. Questions? All good reasons for yeah. yupping. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate Thank your you passion all. for it. Right. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks, Sam. Thanks. Presentation by the warming shelter. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the city council. My name is Shayla Moore and I am proud to introduce myself as the executive director of the Warming Shelter. Can we get I've, your address, please, just for the record? Yeah, my, my address, yes. 916 Nebraska Street. Thank you. Um, so this past year, I've assumed the role of leading this vital initiative at the Warming Shelter. I've had the honor of uh, working here for the duration of the last five years. Um, I've witnessed this organization grow from simply being a place to sleep to offering light in the midst of darkness for our homeless community. Um, by inviting community resources into our shelter and providing wraparound support, our organization now plays a vital role in bridging the, the gap in services for individuals who are facing homelessness. In the 10, almost 11 years of operations, we have taken pride in our commitment to operate strictly on the community donations that, and have never formally requested the assistance of the City of Sioux City for our operational budget. However, the reality that we face is a challenging one. Um, the steady number of homeless individuals in our community, each with increasing needs, has made operating without stable sources of income increasingly difficult. Today, I come before you to ask for your support and consideration. We request that the city consider including the warming shelter in their 2024 budget. Um, as we speak, we are witnessing an increase in those who are extremely vulnerable as well as homeless. Um, those individuals include the elderly, disabled, and families with children facing homelessness in our community. If unable to secure additional funding, the closure of our, our shelter will become a real harsh reality. We are the only low barrier homeless shelter in the community. There is no other organization that is serving this population. Uh, many who aren't affected by homelessness directly may not understand the significant impact that this could have on our community and the lives of you and I specifically. 
Um, I'd like to share how I think that the warming shelter's closure would be a great detriment to our community. Without shelter, the safety of these individuals we serve would be compromised, forcing them to seek alternative and likely unsafe places for refuge. This situation heightens the risk of exposure to criminal activities, making these individuals more susceptible to exploitation and violence. Additionally, frigid temperatures, as we've experienced in the last few weeks, will result in harm and death for those who are unsheltered. Speaking from an economic standpoint, closing the warming shelter could have incredible consequences to the economic well-being of our city. Without shelter for our homeless population, our community will see an influx in um, tax costs, um, emergency services, health care, and law enforcement will respond to the heightened needs of the homeless population. This will place additional strain on local budgets and resources. Um, local businesses may also face indirect impacts. Um, the visible increase in homelessness and the challenges faced by those individuals facing homelessness without shelter may discourage people from wanting to frequent in certain areas. Um, I would predict that this would affect um, the downtown Sioux City area specifically. Um, law enforcement will experience heightened demands as they respond to issues related to public safety, survival behaviors, and potential conflicts arising from individuals seeking shelter. This dual strain underscores the interconnected challenges faced by these critical community services in the absence of the vital resource like the warming shelter. Neighboring cities like Omaha and Sioux Falls have recognized the crucial role that these facilities play in their communities. Their city council governments have allocated funds to support the operations of these shelters. City council members, supporting our shelter isn't just about a place to stay. It's an investment in the safety, economic prosperity, and community well-being. And I hope that we can find a way to keep our shelter operating together. Thanks for your consideration. Any questions? How much does Sioux Falls contribute? They, it would be specific to the shelters that they're supporting. So oh, each one is different? What's the dollar amount? So, Joe, can you help me? 125. 125. And how much does Omaha contribute? Um, far more than that, the specific number, 500,000. That's that, how much are you suggesting the city contribute? I would suggest um, that the city contribute at least enough for us to ensure that we're able to operate during the winter months. Our um, monthly budget at the warming shelter um, is a around 70,000. And that is with us recently eliminating night patrol, um, which is on-site armed security, which was one of our largest expenses. And how many months are you suggesting that for? Um, six months out of the year is what we suggest our operations look like. Um, we do, however, intend and hope to continue operations in the summer months for the incredibly vulnerable, such as families with young children, um, disabled, and um, elderly. So you're looking at 420, and Sioux Falls, a city about twice our size, contributes 100 and a quarter. I'm trying to put my arms around how that's even within the realm of reasonability. Well, reasonability-wise, I, I would say I didn't, ha I didn't come with a specific number. I came with the hope that you guys would be willing to um, consider all aspects of what the shelter um, contributes to the city and um, base your decision on um, how, how much you consider us to be a value in our city, which I believe that um, right now we're housing 130 to 150 people a night, and I would say that that's pretty valuable. Okay, questions? I appreciated your presentation. Um, you hit a lot of the highlights. Um, not only do we have the, the human part of things with the warming shelter, but we also have made um, significant investments in the downtown area. Absolutely. And I, I don't know what it would be like without the warming shelter having its doors open. Um, and you said it's been in operation for about almost 11 years now? Yep. Um, in May, that will be our 11th year of operations. 11th year. Mm -hmm. And that was without any kind of, um, there weren't any governmental 
they never ask. No, nope. we, any, we any have not asked before this point in time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shayla. Shayla. I apologize. That's fine. Um, and what I wanted to ask was the city offers, you know, a lot of um, onboarding services and services for housing, et cetera. And do you find yourself working more in conjunction with the city with our neighborhood services department from when you opened until now? Absolutely. Um, we've got a lot of resources and sometimes I feel like they're not quite utilized as much as they could be as far as directing some of the people from the warming shelter. Can you talk to me about that a little bit? Certainly. Um, in the last year, I would say that our relationship with neighborhood services has um, it has been incredible. Um, I took over in February of last year, um, already having quite a good relationship with the gals down there. Um, since then, we have actually hired a um, resident resource and advocacy liaison, and that individual attends weekly meetings down at Neighborhood Services, um, which allows us to connect our residents with those resources, as well as bring back information. One of the things that, um, one of the huge barriers for homeless individuals is, you know, the contact and being able to, you know, go back and forth. And by us having that available, we're able to bring that information back to the shelter, make, make sure that they're staying on track and help them, you know, take the steps that necessary to get to the next, the next level and exit homelessness. And I would think our relocation of our neighborhood services offices to a street level makes it very accessible, you know, for those experiencing homelessness to access. Absolutely. Um, which is better than being inside City Hall somewhere, lost in the halls, looking around for where you're going. Um, I feel like there's a perception sometimes um, within the city that the city doesn't actually, you know, do that much. You know, you see that on social media here or there. But through our neighborhood services department, we do a lot. And I'm going to ask Amy to come up just to go over a couple of things. Absolutely. Um, and I'm not. It's not against helping funding. I just want others to be aware of how much the city does do. And we don't have a shelter called the Sioux City Homeless Shelter, sure. you know? And Absolutely. so that perception can be that we don't do anything. Right. But we do. We have staff that are working on it diligently. And you know that by working more closely with our Neighborhood Services Department. Absolutely. So I asked Amy to come up today and yeah. just talk about it with the gallery and so that Certain. our citizens could realize that. Yeah, may, Thank I, you, may I add one more bit? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am so very grateful for yep. the, for the yep. work that I they do. I know that you've been working with them more. Absolutely. And um, final uh, statement is that i just like to share that the, the one thing that sets us apart from the services that they provide and mm -hmm. what we provide is we provide the base level. We keep mm -hmm. these people alive yep. so that they can get those services. So that's something that I would really like everybody to mm -hmm. think about and consider. Right, right. I do understand the differences, but the end game is to break them out of their situation Absolutely. and move them ahead so that they enjoy a better life. Absolutely. You I know, agree. no matter what that might be. Um, can you tell me, do you feel like the numbers at the shelter have increased in, you've been there five, yes. six years? So I would, I would, I wouldn't go as far as saying increased. I would say in the last couple of weeks, we've had more numbers well, yes, because people colder. aren't willing to stay outside when right, it's that right, cold. Right, right. But the, the, the populations that we're serving has changed. Um, in past years, I probably maybe would see two to three families per year. Mm -hmm. Right now we have six family rooms and quite literally since February of last year when I uh, took over as director, all of those rooms have been full mm -hmm. at all points in time. But strict head counts, the number of <laughs> bodies in bed. Numbers like have they're, remained. They've remained steady yes. the same. Yep. Okay, I'd hope that they would start going down, right. honestly, and, to and, move people out of there and into the next right. stage, into and, another level of assistance, you yes. know, rather than out of the life saving. Right. And that, that's our hope as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we see new faces, new people, and we never, we, we never turn anybody away. Right. So. right, I understand. 
Okay. You track that, that you actually bring up a good so point. So in the past, we did not. Um, when I took over as director, I did come up with a system of tracking um, our residents, who we're seeing, how often we're seeing them, um, who who is repeat, you know, more, more so on the chronic end, and where they're coming from. One of the stereotypes is that people are just being busted in on in buses from, you know, Minnesota and they're a different them places. Down and that is inaccurate. Right. Um, and that was one of the reasons I worked really hard to get you know, some of those tracking um, in yeah. in line was so that we could track those things and kind of, you know, push back a little bit and be like, no, right. these are our people. Well, and I think it's important just to have that data yeah. to be able to track and show and, and just see what those trends are to be able to put put that into perspective. Absolutely. And, and before Amy shares some of the stuff that we're working on, in addition to your services, I just wanted to commend you. I since you've taken over this um, operation, I just have really heard great things, um, not Thank only you. about you and what you're doing um, up there at the warming shelter, but also your collaboration with city staff. And I think that that's really imperative to um, really moving forward in a meaningful way for these individuals. And so I just wanted to take an opportunity to commend you and congratulate you on this, this position. And I think you're doing a great job. And so Thank I really you. appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll echo that too. It has been really nice working with Shayla. And then Shayla also has a couple of her staff that are attending our coordinated entry meetings. And I'll explain what that is in a second. And that has been crucial for us finding people when they get referrals to programs. Um, it's really made a big difference. Um, so I guess I'll start with the first thing. We, our office about a year ago took over the management of the homeless management information system. And what that does, it's used by um, several different agencies that are serving those that are experiencing homelessness. And we are working with Shayla and all, at the Warming Shelter and also, also the Gospel Mission. They are both interested in um, participating in that software. And that will help us track people and make sure that they're getting services and see what they have already accessed and things of that nature. So we're looking forward to moving forward with that piece. Um, the next piece that we just took over approximately a year ago also is coordinated entry. And what that is, anybody who is experiencing homelessness, we are, once they're sheltered and settled, we are the very first point of contact. And they come to our office and we do an assessment with them and try and determine um, how vulnerable they are and HUD no longer allows us to refer people to HUD funded programs first come first serve it's how vulnerable they are so whoever is um, it, having the most difficulty resolving through um, either their substance abuse um, or whatever it is any of those things then they score a little bit higher and they get to the toward the top of the list and then we can refer them to a program and try and help them first and that's something we have not done in the past mm, um, past years we, the city has not. Right. It was by a different organization, right. but it's fairly new, this concept as far as HUD yep. is concerned. Yep. yep, it's new for us. And it has been great, like you said, our location at 521 Nebraska is- Big, big difference. It, a huge difference, it's really nice. The people who score lower, they tend to self-resolve more often. They've either got a little bit of income or family or somebody who can help them get um, get housed on their own. So, but uh, at that point, though, if they the go at that point, if they score a little lower, mm -hmm. not quite as a dire as those above them, you can give them suggestions, though. We can. We have a landlord list of landlords right. who are really good to work with. We have a security deposit program if they have income. Um, and that will pay up to. We can pay their full security deposit right. as long as they meet the qualifications, which is having income and their rent and utilities can't be more than half of their income. And you can catch them up if they're behind? Is that um, another we program? We could. That funding just ended. We had been running that program for the past two years. Um, it was our homeless prevention program, and that is a huge need um, in our community, and we'll continue to seek funding for that. But since September of 2022, we served 115 households, um, $429,000, and the program, we still have a couple people still on the program will pay their rent till the end of February, and then we're, or the end of March, and then we're done with that one until we can find more funding. Um, we also take referrals from coordinated entry in our office. We have a rapid rehousing program. And so um, in addition to managing the program, we have staff that attend that meeting that accept referrals and we put them in our rapid rehousing program. What that can do, it 
can pay their rent for up to a year. Um, they have to attend case management meetings, um, meet all the requirements, you know, be trying. We try and get them on the Section 8 um, waiting list, you know, help them find employment, all different, whatever they need to kind of make them more stable and on their own. That's what we do through that program. That, pro that funding came from the state and we currently have 14 households, 42 people, that are currently housed as part of that program. And we just keep accepting referrals every week to keep adding to that. Um, we have, as of December 31st, we have expended about $200,000 as part of that program. And then, Let's see, oh, we also have, um, we just received a grant from the state, we're gonna be doing street outreach, where we will be actually going out in the community. The purpose of street outreach is to connect those who are not staying at the warming shelter or the gospel mission. Um, they're not reaching out for any services, they're not in the system. We need to connect them to services. So um, we have a couple of people in our office that will be going out to make relationships with those that are not, that they're a little bit service resistant and try and build a relationship to get them on the coordinated entry list so that we can get them referred to programs. Um, we also do, we help people get their IDs, social security cards, birth certificates, things like that while they're waiting to get a referral. And that subject of they're busing all these people here and dropping them off. You know, yeah. we've all heard that. Oh, they're yeah. sending them down from Sioux Falls. They're yes. coming from And people Omaha. have seen it happen. Yeah, yeah I've seen busloads of them. But, I have but we will, if you have someone who's homeless and doesn't have the resources who says, I just want to get to Indiana to get back to my family where I can stay, we will purchase them a bus ticket. Is that, we're still that doing is that? correct. We do that. We we're not rounding multiple. people up and shipping them out. No, Good. multiple times a week we have people stop by our office. Right. A lot of times what's happened is they've come here and they think that they have a job lined up. Um, they may not pass the background check, whatever it is, for whatever reason that job hasn't worked out. Well, now they're stuck here. They have no money. They cannot figure out how to get back home. And so, yeah, as long as they're going back to family or maybe they have family in another city, like I'm, I'm homeless here in Sioux City, but if I can get to Colorado, my sister lives there. She said I can live with her for a while. So maybe they're couch of... surfing and wore out their welcome and yeah. something like that. Yeah, so that's what we've been. We, yeah, we do at least a few of those every week. And yeah, I think that's all, pretty much a lot of what So our doing. new outreach workers, I'll, I'll let you go after this. I don't want to burn up too much that's time. Fine. Yeah. I really see a need for that. Um, yeah. I see it yeah. myself daily. I have tried to do a little outreach myself. I, I know I've called and asked you guys to check into an individual I've checked in with them, and I, I hope that we can connect with people like that, because I I I like nothing more, you know, than to see someone who is as disconnected, for example, of this gentleman, to somehow connect with him at his level, so that we can get him, you know, off the street. Yeah, so, we do that a little bit informally now because we are connected to the bus station. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we'll walk by the bench and we'll see somebody sitting out for days in a row. So then we'll just strike up a conversation sure. like, oh, you know, are you from here kind of thing and, mm -hmm. and try and work toward um, helping them out in that way. So it will be really nice to have um, dedicated time to actually go out and do that other than just running back and forth to get a soda. Right, very good. Well, thank you so much. Yep. I appreciate thank you. that. Amy, real quick before you yeah. sit down, can you give your name and title oh, for the yep. recording? Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, Amy Kearns, Neighborhood Services Supervisor. Anyone else be heard? Okay, we're going to go on to the council agenda today. Items 4 through 15J constitute the consent agenda. Items will pass unanimously unless a separate roll call vote is requested by a council member. If you want to speak on an item as I read it, please come to the podium. Remember to state your name and address for the record. If you want to speak on an item not on the agenda, please come up under citizen concerns. I'll move that. Second. Four is the reading of the city council minutes of January 5th and 8th. Five is a motion of reappointing Brian Crichton to the Building and Housing Code Board. Six is a motion approving the certified local government annual report. Seven are actions relating to grants and donations. A is a resolution approving an application to Simcoe Metropolitan Planning Organization Service Transportation Block Grant and Carbon Reduction Programs. 
Eight are resolutions accepting all donations under 25,000 for October through December. Items 8A through F are resolution scheduling hearings on civil penalties against the following businesses for violations of the cigarette laws. A is La Placita Latina, B is One Stop Food and Fuel, C is Sky High Smoke Shop and Vape, D is Flames Tobacco and Vape, E is High V Food Store Number One, and F is Casey's Number 1179. I want to I want to say that I'm really happy to see these again pop up because it seems like we've gone a while without having them, but it's so disappointing to see so many on the list. Um, and I know this $300 fine is not going to do much to dissuade businesses from from training their employees better to make sh making sure that we don't get any nicotine devices in the hands of kids. But um, I can tell you at the high school, it, this is a real problem and we need to take it more seriously. So thank you very much for all the work to the police department on this because um, I'm sure there's more out there. Nine are actions adopting construction documents. A is a resolution adopting plans and specs for the runway 18-36 and taxiway. B, C, D, and E rehabilitation project at the airport. B is a resolution adopting plans and specs for the fire station parking lot repair project. Is Stan here? Who's in charge of this? Gordon, are you in charge? Hey, I just have one question. We, station five is by the McDonald's. We just not that many years ago redid that station. We, did we not redo the concrete at that time? I can't, Gordon I can't Paris, believe City we Engineer. did. Um, that I don't know of at this point. I, we were just asked. No. Well, concrete should have lasted a whole lot longer than if, if it was done when we remodeled that fire station. Mayor, Mayor uh, Tom Everett, Fire Chief. I believe this is a one corner of the parking lot that's sinking. Um, and I think that's all that's wrong there. The rest of this is all the stations, whatever repair work needs to be done in our normal CIP. Um, but I think at Station 5, it's, it's just one spot that's sunk, and therefore it floods every time. Uh, we okay. okay. C is a resolution adopting plans and specs for the Buckwalder Drive Storm Sewer Outfall Repair Project. D is a resolution approving plans and specs for the Sidewalk Program Project. E is a resolution adopting plans and specs for the Big Sioux Pedestrian Bridge Crossing Phase 2 Project. Matt. I just want to say on this one, um, we're still waiting on the Army Corps of Engineers. Is that right? At Salvatore Parks and Recreation Director, yes, that's correct. Okay. But this is just to get everything in place so that we can hit the ground running when we do. Yes, we hope to have that in place by the time construction would start. If we don't, they won't be allowed to work on the bridge until that permit is in hand, but they could still work on everything else in the process. Thank you very much. Yep. Start, when's the start date on that, Matt? Uh, it'll probably be in April. Yep. A long time coming. Thanks for sticking with it. Gosh, yeah. Interactions relating to agreements and contracts. A is a resolution approving a work, work order for RS and H Iowa for the Siouxland Nexus project at the airport. B is a resolution authorizing the establishment and operation of the Northern Valley Association and Northern Valley Association II Property Owners Association. C is a resolution approving a change order number one to the contract with Knife River Midwest for the airport pavement repair and taxiway replacement lights project. D is a resolution approving the third amendment to the developer development and lease agreements with Oracle Aviation. I need to abstain on that item, conflict of interest. Staff request, just a minute. Oh, I apologize. Just, just a minute. I got. It. I didn't finish. But not your. I'm sorry. Your, no, that, they added something. You didn't know that. Staff requests that we a motion to amend the agenda by moving this consideration of item 10D after discussion item number 39. So I will move that. Second. Moore. Aye. O'Kane. Aye. Chainer. Aye. Scott. Aye. Waters. I think I can say aye for that. We're just moving the item, but so aye. 11 are actions authorizing payments. A is a resolution authorizing payment to Subserpco for the Bruner Avenue and Nash Street Siphon Project. I need to abstain conflict of interest. 
B is a resolution authorizing the early release of retained funds to CW Suter and Son for the MLK Transportation Center cooling tower replacement. I need to abstain conflict of interest. C is a resolution approving fund transfers for December. D is a motion approving the list of claims, expenses, and receipts for December. 11E through G are resolutions approving settlements of claims and authorizing payments. 12 is an action relating to property. Mayor. Yes. Back on 11F, Warrior Hotel, I need to abstain on that conflict of interest. Can you say 11? Oh, or something. Correct. Okay, yeah. I, I, I just had to read the heading. I don't have to read each one. Okay. okay. All right. Very good. 12 are actions relating to property. A is a resolution approving a purchase agreement and accepting a temporary construction easement with Morningside Assembly of God Church for the Elk Creek Roundabout Project and authorizing payment. B is a resolution authorizing a lien holder's consent to the termination of declaration of establishment of horizontal property regime for town, town view apartments. C is a resolution authorizing a lien holder's consent to termination of declaration of establishment of horizontal property regime for Shire Apartments. 13's purchasing A is a resolution awarding a purchase order to CW, CDW government for 16 tablets and accessories. B is a resolution awarding a purchase order to striker sales for chest compression systems and accessories. C is a resolution awarding a purchase order to high tech battery solutions for test for chest compression systems and mounts. 14 are applications for beer and liquor license. 15, the board commission and committee meetings. Anyone to be heard on any of those items? I suppose I better vote on things. Passes 5 0. Appointments to boards and commissions. 16, the motion approving two of the following three applicants to the Parks and Recreation Board. Three year term expiring 31st of December 2026. Wow, this is tough. I didn't realize I should have looked that better. I didn't realize. I thought we had enough to do all three of them. I have a question. How many terms has Frank served? That up. Just one. Just one? Okay. So this will be the first second term. He got on because of pickleball. He's a big pickleball enthusiast. Well, I'll make a motion. We can vote it up or down. I, I like all three of them. It's unfortunate that we don't have another opening, but I'll, I'll go with uh, Frank Brenzo and Al Sturgeon. I'll second it. Hopefully we can get Jacob on there. You can vote electronically on this one. I put it in there for you. Thank you. I'm with you, Mayor. I think that there's they all have great aspects and deserve the appointment, but hopefully in the future we can find a good spot for Jacob, whether it's on this committee or other. Yeah. I find one for him. Passes 5-0. 17 is an ordinance amending Chapter 25.05 site development to update the requirements for digital display signs and off-premise advertising signs and to repeal the interim sign ordinance. PNZ recommends approval, first consideration approved January 8th. Is there a motion for second reading? I'd move for second. Second. discussion or any I do have a couple questions on this one so a couple of the things that we talked about looking into were the uh, possibility of looking at on-premise signs I was wondering if we had any more information about that we also talked about the 30-day abandoned signs have we looked at um, extending that date out at all um, for abandoned signs for ones that had not been updated oh for the billboards First mention planner, uh, we did not uh, look at changing that, but there's definitely something we can continue to look at. So let me understand that. If after 30 days they have the same sign up for an event that already happened, that could make that sign subject to be demolished? It could. Typically we would reach out to the sign owner first, right. notify them before proceeding with any abandonment. And it wasn't just with event signs, was it? Or was it? 
Correct. Yeah, but if there's no sign message or if the business has left, but their sign is still up, that would right. all. Could I think we should give them band. more time. Thirty days does not seem like much time to take it down and remarket it. I mean, obviously, you're going to take it down and put a new one on at the same time if you can to save on your labor costs. So. 30 days just does really seem like a short amount of time. Well, and I'd be concerned with our sign-free corridors and not being able to put signs along the interstate that should should we make that call and have a sign torn down that I mean, that's just not place. We can definitely take a look at that, uh, bring that back. To the next. Okay. I was going to say too, Chris, is the best thing probably just to give you some of our thoughts or email thoughts and considerations or different ideas and things for you to look into so you can bring it back and Absolutely. troubleshoot them? Is that what you'd probably appreciate then? Sure. Yeah, that gives us a little bit more time, a little bit more direction because we kind of left the last meeting not knowing exactly what any direction was for any what changes. What people would so. maybe like to see or something like Correct. that. Yeah. Yep. So if and you're I, looking at giving us direction to make any changes, then please reach out to us. Great, okay. and I, I know I plan on doing that. I didn't, we had quite a few things on the agenda today, so I uh, didn't, get a, didn't get you called or emailed this week, um, but I will plan to do so. I don't plan on doing third reading today. Um, we were requested not to be able to do that, and I'd like to give as much time as possible for council and any other citizens or sign company owners or interested parties to be able to offer their perspective. So just wanted to let you know that I plan on doing that, but I wanted to make sure that's what you would prefer. Absolutely. I'll Thanks. email mine. Okay. You mail mine, I'm sure it won't make any difference. <laughs> Come on, Mayor. Come on. Now, where's that positive half Yeah, half exactly. Full? We have you on tape we saying that. We <clears throat> Others to be heard. Anyone else be heard? Oh, Barbara. I didn't know Barbara the, Slonaker, 1336 didn't know the House Cannon of Free Enterprise Avenue. was going to take a position on something <laughs> yeah. finally. That's good to see. That it's your unlucky day, Mayor. Okay, uh, yeah. go ahead. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm really here in support of Verde, um, one of our chamber members. And as you probably know, David English is ill and was not able to be here tonight, but I'm still here. In, in his stead, if you will. Um, in December, I know Dakin Schultz from the Iowa DOT came here and presented an update on the Gordon Di Drive project, um, including the proposed timeline um, for that project. And he mentioned at that time that his anticipation was they'd be holding meetings with landowners on April 30th and stakeholders on May 1st. So it's only a few months away. So with that in mind, my simple request is, is, would it be possible to hold off the passing of the new sign ordinance, I know you're only on second reading tonight, until after those meetings have taken place so that we kind of know more about the, the location, the preferred alternative of the Gordon Drive project and how that's going to affect um, the, the billboards along that route. Thank you. When's our interim expire? Is it? March 31st. March 31st. We'd have to extend it. How do you feel about Good idea. that? Questions? Makes sense. If that's a direction you want us to look at Gordon Drive and maybe some options that we could review, and obviously once we know exactly what the DOT is doing, we can always come back and revisit the signed ordinance as well. If that's Didn't we establish at our meeting that they would be allowed to put the billboard back up? It would just conform to the new spacing? Correct. Correct. So it would... I think we'd lose like one or two or something right. is and I think yeah. that's the mayor's point where it. if the mayor wants to send an email with that direction or make that recommendation or you know to grandfather in at least those I mean we could kind of look into that the problem is you're moving the bridge 50 100 feet south that there aren't going to be sign locations and for people to plant right that's right. the I problem think that because the people that own the property not want to sell. May not have a sign. Right. They, may, so, they may not own the property when it's done. That's that's my so point. So difficult from the business community, obviously difficult for someone who's running a business to plan that far ahead at, at what might be, at least if we got a few more months and know exactly where that uh, Gordon Drive bridge is going and the new viaduct, that, we know that would where be helpful. Going. I think the I state think knew know. where it was going two years ago, even though they wanted to pretend like they wanted our input. I would say publicly it's not known. Right. That's and I think that's where to we base decisions. On, yes, right? to base and I think decisions. that's where we could have more of an intentional conversation about looking at where it's proposed and how that would impact and who owns the property or who would be able to maybe have a sign. So yeah, we can have those conversations. And then if we determine yes that it would be beneficial to push that back, we can have that conversation at least. But maybe gather more information at least. Okay. 
between this week and next. Thank you. It's definitely a unique situation that, yes, we can continue to look at that, whether it's within this code change or something in the future. That right, it gives it whatever be you later. That we would look at that. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Passes four to one, I vote no. Uh, we'll go to, we won't do third reading. We'll go to 18's a public hearing to obtain comments regarding the waste water treatment plan improvement project for HVAC improvements and odor control. I'll move that. Second. Public hearing's now open. Does anyone want to be heard? Please come forward. Seeing none, the hearing is closed. O'Kane. Aye. Shaner. Aye. Scott. Aye. Waters? Aye. Moore? Aye. Nineteen is a public hearing to obtain comments regarding the wastewater treatment plan improvements project for safety and odors, repair deficiencies, enhanced reliability, and expanded capacity improvements. I'll move that. Second. Public hearing is now open. Does anyone want to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Shaner? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Moore? Aye. Okay. Aye. 20 is a resolution approving a revolving fund environmental information document regarding improvements at the wastewater treatment plant. I make a motion to amend the item to include an additional revolving fund environmental information document for wastewater treatment plant improvements, which you were all furnished this morning. Second. On, on the amendment. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Moore? Aye. Okay. Aye. Shainer. Aye. Now on the amendment, or on the original, the amended. Do we have to do an amend, vote on the amended now? Waters? Aye. Moore? Aye. O'Kane? Aye. Shainer? Aye. Scott? Aye. Right. Should that have been electronic or no? I just... You're fine. You're fine. Fun. 21 is a hearing and resolution determining an area of the city to be an economic development area designated in an urban renewal project and adopting amendment number four to the amended restated Downer Park urban renewal plan. I'll move that. Second. Public hearing is now open. Anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Mr. Waters abstained. It passes four to zero. Eight is a hearing and resolution approving the lease of Riverside Recreational Sports Complex or the Arena Sports Academy. That was deferred from January 8th. I'll move it. Second. Public hearing is now open. Anyone want to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Back when our legal department wasn't so efficient, we'd do 10 or 12 of these in a row, but now we do them one at a time. All right, Mayor. <laughs> Passes five to zero. 23 is a hearing and resolution approving the lease of Center Street Park to Westside Little League, deferred from January 18th. I'll move that. Second. There's public hearing is now open. Anyone want to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Passes 5024 is a hearing and resolution accepting the proposal of the Morningside Little League and authorizing the lease of property at 4900 South Lewis Boulevard. I'll move that. Second. Hearing is now open. Anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Passes 5025 is a hearing resolution approving the lease of Pulaski Park to Morningside Little League, deferred from January 8th. I'll move that. Second. Public hearing is now open. If anyone want to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Mm -hmm. 
passes 5026, a hearing a resolution approving the lease of Kirk Hanson Park to Westside Little League, deferred from January 8th. I'll move that. Second. Anyone who want to be heard? The public hearing is now open. Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Passes 5027 is a hearing resolution approving the lease of Goldie Park to Westside Little League. Deferred from January 8th. I'll move that. Second. Hearing's now open. Anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Councilman okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> it's the problem when you have to read each one of these, you'd lull us to sleep. That <laughs> passes 5 0. 28 is a hearing and resolution approving a lease of Hubbard Park to Hubbard Park Association deferred from January 8th. Staff requests the motion to amend the item to approve the lease to the Sioux City Fastpitch Pass Pass Softball Association on behalf of the Hubbard Park Association. I'll move the amendment. Second. Waters? Aye. Moore? Aye. O'Kane? Aye. Shaner? Aye. Scott? Aye. How come we don't have to have a hearing on this one? Now, on the amended motion, the hearing is now open. Anyone want to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Passes 5 0. 29 is a hearing and resolution accepting the proposal of headed, headed Little League for the lease of property at 2404 Hawkeye Drive. Motion is requested to defer this item to February 5th, and I'll move that. Second. That'll be our next meeting, won't it? So that's true with the sign ordinance, third reading. It'll be February 5th. Correct. S is 5 0. 30 is a hearing resolution approving the lease of Ruger Field to Western Iowa Tech Community College deferred from January 8th. Motion requested to defer this item until February 5th. I'll move that. Second. That brings up a good point. Barbara, I misspoke, not next Monday, the 5th. Thank you. That would be our fifth. Thank you. Fifth Monday of the month. No, nope, I didn't catch that. So I had two meetings. In the meantime, two uh, Councilwoman Shaner and I will be um, meeting with the Aesthetics Committee for for the Viaduct Design. So hopefully we can get some answers for you there too. Who do we need? Councilman Payne. Okay. Okay. I think 31, wasn't it? Yeah, now that's 5031 is a hearing and resolution approving the lease of the Riverside Recreational Sports Complex, Miracle Field to the Miracle League, deferred from January 8th, and a motion is requested to defer this item till February 5th. I'll move that. Second. Passes 5 0 is a hearing and resolution accepting the proposal of Floyd Slow Pitch Softball for the lease of property at 3562 Harbor Drive is deferred from January 8th. The motion, motion is requested to defer this item until February 5th, and I'll move that. Second. <coughs> Uh, 
SS 5033 is a hearing and resolution accepting the proposal of Siouxland Splash for the purchase of property at 3820 Highway 75 North, authorizing the development of minimum assessment agreement and a 10 year option purchase right of first refusal agreement. I'll move that. <coughs> Second. Public hearing is now open. Sorry. Mayor and I Council. Didn't hear the motion. I'm sorry. I didn't hear him say. Public hearing is now open. Uh, Marty Doherty, Economic and Community Development. Mayor <coughs> Council, um, back in December, you approved the first step of the urban renewal process for the sale of the land for the water park development. And now we've completed the 30 day period, um, notice period. Uh, we, you'll notice we are asking for the uh, completion of the hearing and um, direction to the city manager to move forward with the agreement. Um, it's a complex agreement. We're very close to being done with it, but we would bring it back, I think, in two weeks at the, the next council meeting for final approval. So um, developers with us today, and they'd like to tell you a few details of the plan, and I'll turn it over to them. Okay. So Joe Zaring, uh, one of the owners of Frontline Development, We're, we just brought some updates for you guys, but before we get into that, do you have any questions for us? No? No, right. not right now. What's that? No, not initially. I, <laughs> I didn't know we were going to have a presentation. Hey, this is well, exciting. And want, you brought visual aid. We, we brought us a few details. We're, we're, doing, we're doing some things. <laughs> no some doubt. Progress. Great. Uh, as Marty, just need a little break up here with the reading and stuff. No <laughs> doubt. Exactly. we got to wake excited. us up here on wake this. Us up. Come on. This is exciting. Why don't we have all of you th state your name and address for the record? That way we've got them recorded. Um, I'm Hank Klopper. I'm also with Frontline Development, one of the principals, along with Joe. Uh, my address is um, Quail Hollow Circle in the Dunes. And uh, with us is uh, Johnny Blevins, who's a consultant with uh, 25 or so years of water park design, build, operation experience uh, that we've been working closely with. Johnny Blevins with P23 Consulting, and I'm in uh, Canton, Texas. Go so, ahead. Oh, sorry. All right, so we just want to give you guys a visualization. We're still working through, as, as Marty said, me and Marty have been spending a lot of time together. I appreciate uh, his work along with uh, Ms. Shaner here. But we are uh, moving, moving things around. We're getting a, a nice lazy river. We can look at and talk about as much of this stuff as you want. But between the lazy river, wave pool, one of the biggest kids zones in the, in the Midwest, uh, we're going to have a, a huge slide tower with uh, actually a really iconic slide. It's going to be the first one in the United, in the United States. Um, so we're going to really try and make a big impact for Sioux City here. We want to make this a, a really fun staple in the community. Okay. Tell you what, this has me looking forward to warmer weather, folks. Um, yeah. <laughs> for sure. One better day to talk about a water park. Yeah, no good. <laughs> right. I was going to ask you how, the, how you're enjoying the weather up here from Canton, oh, but you know. It's yeah. the greatest. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. I just want Good to luck. say thank you for yeah. being there with all my questions, all my interactions, my suggestions. Sometimes they weren't asked for, but I gave them. <laughs> and I appreciate your investment in Siouxland. I really do. Siouxland, Sioux City specifically, has wanted a water park for a long time. And I really appreciate you wanting to satisfy that need and investing these kind of monies um, to our community. And we're going to do our best to help you make it a success. And I think everyone, all the citizens, will get over there and support it once we get it built. Yeah, I just you. want to take a second, too, to thank the council and Julie Shader in particular, who's been working with us closely on this project, and the mayor, um, who has been very supportive throughout. Marty, of course, has been uh, seeing more of us than he wants to, I'm sure, but we really appreciate it, and uh, we're uh, moving forward at a steady pace. We said we're going to go out to lunch when we get this done, so let's go. <laughs> no doubt. Thank you. All right. Good luck, guys. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. A lot. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, the news is going to want to take pictures. Anyone else to be heard? The hearing is closed. Passes 5034 is a hearing and ordinance vacating a portion of the drainage right of way adjacent to 3617 West Forest Street Circle, 
I will move that. Second. Public hearing is now open. Anyone to be heard? Seeing none, the, he the hearing is closed. Passes 5-0. Is there anybody opposed to waiving the statutory rule? I'll move that. Second. Moore. Aye. O'Kane. Aye. Shainer. Aye. Scott. Aye. Waters. Aye. I'll move second and third. Second. O'Kane. Aye. Shainer. Aye. Scott. Aye. Waters. Aye. Moore. Aye. 35 is a resolution of pro proposing to sell adjacent property adjacent to 3617 West 4th Street Circle. The petitioners, Mark Sorensen, Jr., I'll move that. Second. I will not move that, I'm sorry. I'll move it. Second. Abstain, uh, passes four to zero, I abstain conflict of interest. Ordinance is 36 is an ordinance amending chapter 10.98 schedules of the municipal code to adopt new traffic schedules. I'll move that. Second. Passes five zeros. Anybody opposed to waiving the statutory rule? Nope. No. That. Second. Shainer? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Moore? Aye. O'Kane? Aye. I'll move second, third. Second. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Moore? Aye. O'Kane? Aye. Shainer? Aye. 37's resolution approving a second amendment to the management agreement with. OBG 360 to provide operation and management of the convention center. I need a motion for that. I'll move it. Second. I just have, I should have probably called you on this, Bob. I'm going to apologize, but we're under no obligation to seek proposals on this. Because it's an amendment to. Or well, I know, but that why? But you got an Oracle contract that we amended to put improvements in in the building that was a contract that already existed with L and L, but we made it a separate contract, and so they get to pay sales tax on that material now, and I just wonder what the difference is. I know you're going to give me all the legal reasons. I know there is a difference, <laughs> but it's just kind of fun don't to know what do it things is. around here. And this would be a policy decision because it's a management agreement for a city facility. Oh. Well, I don't have any specific questions. I just would say that, you know, working with OVG, I think especially in these other properties, um, has really been a good relationship. I found Nick and staff, all members of staff, to really be open to feedback, uh, comments, and, and really amenable to those different things when we're trying to troubleshoot things together. Um, I think that there could be some good synergies um, from the management of this and, and the collaboration or continued collaboration of these different properties. So I would look forward to kind of seeing what that could be and, and taking a situation that I think was, was fairly uncertain to hopefully, hopefully this can be a win for, for us as well as them and, and the property in general. So appreciate it. Does it have a 90 day bailout clause? Hmm? We won't be using. <laughs> Just kidding. It's important to me. I know is Alex important. has got a wonderful relationship with OVG. Mine is not so wonderful. I'm not going to sit here and tell you how great they are because I've had my difficulties. Fortunately, I don't have to do business with them anymore. That's the good news. But, but I want to make sure that. We do have a termination. There is a termination clause. 
I don't know if it's 90 days or not. What the I'm not positive that it's 90, but we do have a termination clause. Nick, does anybody know what it is? I'd have to look it up. I'm sorry, Mayor. And I should have asked this question earlier, but it doesn't matter. It's going to pass. What I will say is what I, what I appreciate, Nick, especially about your management of the facilities is you're a great steward to the location, care of things. If there's ever a concern that anybody, and I'm not talking about just a council member, but anybody ever airs, it's, it's on your radar and you take care of it. I don't think I have ever attended an event where I've thought, why is there toilet paper sticking to the ceiling? Or why is this broken? Why, why is this shattered? Um, and, and I appreciate that you take care of the city. Do a good job at that. Mayor, if there is a, a failure to perform, there's a 30-day written notice clause that they have then a period um, to cure the breach after that. But we don't have what we have in the existing contract, a 90-day buyout. That would still apply in this situation. Because this is written in contracts. We because this, this is, is an amendment just amending to the original agreement. So we're just adding the management of the convention center to the original agreement. All of the terms of the yeah, original I don't agreement. Want, yeah, that's the other thing I don't want. I don't want two or one agreement. Because what if they perform excellent at the Tyson and not so excellent at the convention center? Then we've got to terminate them. At both Would there be the separability of the amendment rather than the contract as a That doesn't make sense to me. Listen, I have no problem with the new guy that runs it. He's doing a fine job. I always felt that way, but, but I don't want to get into a situation where we have 1,400 uncooked meals again and we say, well, we got to throw them out of the whole thing or we got to live with it. Amber, would the be obligated to do that if we were... Because it's a contract, the parties would always be to negotiate in terms of the agreement. So if we found it necessary to negotiate the removal of them from management of one facility, we'd be free to approach them and ask for that. Whether or not they would be open to that, I can't make any guarantees. I think I can answer that, so. Nothing further? No. <laughs> it passes four to one, I vote no. I don't, I think it should be a separate, completely different contract that way if you have a problem on one building, but this is what it is. 38 is a resolution authorizing the fire chief to fill vacant EMT paramedic and lead paramedics with firefighter positions through attrition and retirements. Would you like to move that? I'll move it. Is there a second? Second, probably just for the discussion, so second. Well, I'll speak first. I had the opportunity, I don't call it an opportunity, it's something you don't want to have to use, but to use the ambulance service at least three times in the last four or five years, I've relayed this to the chief. And I can tell you that I couldn't tell the difference if it was a paramedic or fireman. The only way you can tell the difference is I think the sleeve's a little different. The care was excellent. And I don't understand why it's all or none. I don't get that. There are, there are people that don't want to be firefighters that are very capable of taking care of my family when the need arises. And so when I vote on things, I say, you know, this is a $250,000 enhancement to the budget. You can say it's gonna take time. It's $250,000, 35 to start. And what am I gaining for the care of the citizens of Sioux City for that 35? I understand. We've got some problems filling the EMT. I'm not even opposed to some of these positions becoming firefighters, but I'm opposed to, it's never, never gonna be anything but firefighters because again, there are some people that are excellent paramedics that may not be able to, to test to be a firefighter and make that 
that grade. So we've just locked them out and we're hope, hopeful that we can get firefighters. Well, guess what? We have problems with getting cops. We have some days we've had problems getting the list on firefighters is much shorter than it ever was. I mean, it's not even remotely close how many. Those lists could just go 200 people. Now you're lucky if you get 50. So we've just said, this is the way it's going to be, and I've got a real problem with that. I think you should retain some of these positions as EMT and paramedics. I know the union doesn't, the union has never liked this deal, and I don't know why. I don't, I do, just don't get why it's so important that you had a chance to have this group in your union, and quite frankly, your leadership at the time had some responsibility and blew it, as far as I'm concerned. It, it, they should have been in your union. I get that, but that's not, it wasn't because you didn't have that opportunity, so. How many year goes, years ago was that? I don't know, Seven, five, six. six. Six years ago, I remember that. Chief, you can come on up. I'm Everett Fire Chief, and I'm here to answer any questions that I can regarding the staffing proposal that's in front of you tonight. I appreciate that there's going to be um, emotions and um, opinions on both sides, but I think I've explained to all of you that my purpose is to solve a staffing issue here. So, Hi, I'll take a minute. I, I, I want to echo a lot of what the mayor said. Um, I, am, I am not against having more firefighters, more well-trained firefighters, I, I think that that makes sense. The part that really was concerning for me is it was only after this was published that we started hearing from a lot of people on the rescue side of the house that, that were kind of surprised to see this. Um, and that, that disconnect that this wasn't widely known was kind of jarring for me. Um, I sitting through a similar thing in school right now. Uh, in March, they're gonna let us know who has to go teach elementary school and, and who gets to return next year. Um, that's, that's very stressful to live through. And I can only imagine what, um, what some of these people in, in EMT are, are thinking, like, you know, how many more years until I just don't have a job? And I, I, I think that's a lot of stress to put on someone and then just throw this at them and say, hey, this is happening. I was under the assumption that everybody was kind of on the, the same page and that this was widely circulated and, and I'm not getting that impression since last Thursday. Um, I, don't, I don't think this is a bad move. I think having you know, well-trained firefighters that are helping you know, the EMS shifts and are, and are out there, I, I'm not concerned if my life is in a firefighter's hands or, or somebody that is not a firefighter, who's gonna do better taking care of me? Um, I'm just concerned that now we've got some people that are in a panic that feel like they've had their positions targeted and um, are concerned about whether or not they're gonna be able to keep their jobs in the future. Can I speak to that, Matthew? Uh, absolutely. Um, we, I, I put out an update to the department explaining kind of the direction that we're going, the general direction on this, or at least the request that I am making and why. Um, and I made it very clear, and I have since, that um, nobody that we currently employ, uh, nobody's job is at jeopardy. Um, we have some great employees on both sides, both divisions, and I hope that some of them stay until they retire. And that could be 25, 30 years on the EMS side. So. That's one important thing to keep in mind here is that nobody's losing their job. Um, nowhere in my proposal does it say there's some kind of a phase out of th those people uh, moving forward. So it'll be done through attrition. As someone retires, that position that is filled will be filled the new, well, as a firefighter slash paramedic or EMT. That's correct. Is there an ability to make this a little bit more fluid? Like we, we have a longer list of available firefighters, right? Of people that we can hire on for fire, right? So let's say down the road, we have a much, a much shorter list for fire and a much longer list um, for EMT. Can we, is there, is there a way that we can e e make it more fluid so that we accept those positions or we allow people, you know what I'm saying? Are we locking ourselves into something that we can't back out of later? Councilman, I think that 
if you look at the three resolutions that make this uh, proposal, the second one is asking for four firefighter hires. We'll have to bring you those hires each time. So that creates some built-in fluidity, Will, um, down the road if things change and there's different circumstances, I think you'll have the opportunity to uh, request some kind of a change there. Chief, I want to somewhat be direct with some of the questions just that I think have been proposed and just have some clarity. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you could address the mayor's question initially for, for what he's saying is basically, you know, is there a reason? What is the cause to go from these EMS side of house or some of those positions to more of a firefighter position? What do, what do you see as the comparative advantage to making that move? If, if you're advocating to do so, because that's to the mayor's point of, he feels that we should continue to have these available. And, uh. Uh, it, it creates staffing flexibility. So basically we can have personnel that can work on any of our rigs um, throughout the city, whether it's an ambulance or a fire rig or something like that. So when we have um, an extra firefighter that day and maybe opening on ambulance, and shift that firefighter over to the ambulance. So it's not a given that there's gonna automatically be firefighters on ambulances right out of the gate. Um, it's gonna depend on staffing shortages when we would slide somebody over, but it gives us that flexibility. And it gives us the additional positions to you know, fulfill the, the slots that we have available each day to staff. Do you have slots open now on fire? We do, we have four, or not fire, on the EMS division, we have four. On the fire side, we have an active list with, uh, I would have to look, but maybe 10 candidates left. But how many, any openings for them or no? No. And Chief, then to address Matthew's question was more, so I know this went out in the, the update. What was the date of that update or when was that sent out? I would have to look. It was, um, let me see here if I have that. looks like around December 20th, right? But this isn't a new problem either. So we've had, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mayor Scott and Councilman O'Kane uh, attended a, a session with our HR team about recruiting. And they talked about how much we've ramped up recruiting and the different things that we've done really since after the first year. So we've been six years with this EMS division. And after that first year, we've, we've kind of had openings that we were always chasing, if you will. Um, and basically, since that time, we ramped up recruiting. We came to you and got uh, pay raises. We came to you and got schedule changes. Um, we've done mileage enhancements for residency, several other things that just haven't allowed us to catch up with that staffing with the turnover. And, and so it's not like a new problem. It's something that the department's been working on for some time. I hoped that it was going to get better after COVID. I just haven't seen it get better. We just haven't been able to catch up. And, I, and I, the reality is people will take your job because they want to be a firefighter. If we, if we didn't allow, which we should not, we should allow, but if we didn't allow people to go from EMT to firefighters, you, would, you wouldn't have, be having the problems you're having. Well, we still can't find people to hire. So you're, okay. you're missing my point. That is part if of our point. If you locked them in, and turned them into firefighters, you wouldn't have the big of problem as you have today. Because a lot of the people became firefighters. I get that. That's why they hired on so they can. But that's, we keep taking them out of the EMT and putting them into firefighter positions. Yep. There's no way to change that. But no. it's not like you haven't recruited them, but you haven't kept them in that side of the house. <clears throat> Because it's their will to move position. Right, there. exactly. exactly. Uh, Either take them as a firefighter or they maybe go to another community. Right, so just this last uh, hiring process that we did, we hired four individuals. Uh, two people are on the fire hiring list. So, and you know, they're in a good position to 
as we have turnover to get an offer to become a firefighter. One wants to test for firefighter and uh, one does not. So that's kind of the makeup that we've seen. Now all four of those are on probation. They have to make it through that in order to remain an employee. But that's kind of the mix that we've seen and, and that is part of the reason we've had turnover for sure. And that's not a negative thing in my opinion. Let me ask you this. Um, first of all, I want to state quality of service, both EMS and the fire department, top notch, best quality of service we, we have in this community. Thank no you. question about it. So I thought that, so it's a vacancy issue that's kind of driving this. And the problem I'm, I'm having, and I, I shared this briefly with Neil because I've got a great deal of respect for his leadership style. Um, I got almost a six-page memo this morning. It's dated yesterday, but I didn't receive it till this morning. And if all of you don't know this about me by now, <laughs> um, I like to go through something very thoroughly. And there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of differences of opinion as to what's going on. And I'd like to air those, not now, because I haven't even read the memo as closely as I could. I, it was mid-morning when I, or I guess it was about 8.30 in the morning when I received it. But I kind of want to sort out what the facts are and what the facts are not, that kind of thing. And I think Neil's very good about doing that. I think, Chief, you'd be very good about doing that. But I just haven't had any dialogue on any of this. And, it's, and to me, it's alarming um, to a certain extent. So. That's where I am with this, but I do have one question that I still am a little bit in the dark on, and that's on training of a firefighter and training of an EMS person, which could be, it could be your paramedic, correct? Par, a paramedic, a lead paramedic, and what's the, what's the other? An EMT. An EMT, right. yeah. Are there's, you, there's fundamental differences in that job class. Um, you've got uh, on the EMS division side, they're, it's a six month probation. They come to us, they already have an EMT or they already have their paramedic. So the training during that six months is very, very hands on. It's protocols, it's, um, it's how we operate, it's driving, it's, it's those kind of things. They're thrown in pretty quickly on, on that side, um, right into the action within a couple months. They can be partners on that ambulance crew. Um, on the fire side, and to get the job on the EMS division side, we have an application period, civil service. Um, they go through what we call an EPAT, which is a modified uh, physical abilities test that we go through, um, and a background check and a physical. Um, on the fire side, it's a one-year probation, so one year of training. Um, we go through, uh, same thing, civil service process, a written test, um, a candidate physical ability test is a nationwide test for firefighters, um, civil service interviews, also a medical physical, and then, and then that one year of training. So, um, and they have to have an EMT at a minimum to be offered the job as well. Thank you. Chief, you brought up the list. Yes. Uh, how many, do you know how many are on the list for EMT? So, on, their list is separate from yours, right? Yes. Okay, so I, yeah. currently we have um, our, our paramedic list had no, no people on it this time. Um, our EMT list had five. We hired four. One declined. And what we have to do when that happens is wait a suitable amount of time to make the offer to that person a second time. If they decline, we can close the list and start the hiring process again. That be, so, is that a civil service protocol? Or? It is. Okay. So right now, those two lists that we, one is active, uh, but we can't do anything with it. There's, there's nobody that wants the job on it. Uh, the paramedic list is empty. The fire list right now has, um, we typically have a list of 20. I think we, are, we have about 10 left on that list. And we don't have trouble filling a list on that side. One of the concerns that was mentioned to me was what if I want to be an EMT or some kind of a medic, et cetera, but I absolutely don't want to do that. I want that to be my career path, but I 
maybe I can't be a firefighter physically or because I, they're two different physical abilities, right? Tests? Yes. What, then what do I do? Is that taking that career path out of Sioux City or, you know, what would I do? Well, we're losing some people to other services, so uh, and that includes the hospitals that would hire EMTs or paramedics, um, you know, a transfer service that might hire um, EMTs or, or whatever. So there's other opportunities, but it certainly does lessen that opportunity in Sioux City. Um, but it's not killing that career path? Is that what you're... Well, it's not killing the career path, but and, and I guess what we're seeing is, again, not enough people that want it for us to fill the positions that we have available. Or some people, I mean, I'm just guessing, but then some people see it as a stepping stone or a career path. I mean, they're moving on, they're yes. advancing to a different position or a different location, whatever that may be. Right. Right. It's a little bit more of a transient uh, position historically. And what I mean by that is not negative. It's that we've had people that moved on to nursing school. We've had people that moved on to flight medic stuff. We've had just changes in career or locations even, doing the same work just in a different location, so. You have the right to ask a person to withdraw from the list. Have we, why do we not do that with this person? I was just told that in these cases that if we do it right away, a second time, and we don't allow some time in between our offers, that um, it, it doesn't seem like a real second offer, it's just a you know, too often. Well, when, they rec when they refuse the first time, don't you have a right to ask them to write a letter and say, I want to withdraw my... Oh, yeah, we, we can do that, but they can remain on the list also. So uh, in this case, I believe uh, that this person is in paramedic school and didn't want to take it, but wanted to remain on the list. That puts you... you have to yeah, just... You know, a little while, we'll make a second offer to that person. If they decline, then they're automatically taken off that list. Chief, I have two questions that I want you just to publicly address. I feel like I know the answers to them, but I want you to at least publicly address these just so it's common knowledge. Number one is, to the mayor's point, I think that um, uh, firefighters are fairly well trained, um, especially on some of the EMS sides of things. They're obviously maybe not doing that as often or as frequently. In some cases, they probably are, maybe even more. But talk to me about the level of care. If I'm just a citizen in Sioux City and I'm watching this, that we're transitioning to firefighters, what is that level of care that I'm going to receive when it transitions? Do I have any reason to worry? What, what are we thinking about as far as training and how can you reassure the people of Sioux City? So the certifications that we require are the same. The training that we require is the same. It's a matter of, you know, as with any employee groups, you have some that maybe are better than, than others uh, at certain aspects of their job or whatever, but from a care perspective, we're still putting a paramedic in a paramedic slot. We're still putting an EMT in an EMT slot and both of those with outstanding training and everything we can possibly do to support them being great at what they do. The second question that I just wanted to kind of address and, and put out there, look, I, I know as far as where I'm sitting on council and this, this has been a trying year as far as finances um, and thinking just about really where we're spending our dollars and what's what's really, I don't know, I hate the mantra bang for your buck, but just mm. being able to stretch our money as far as we can and really be efficient and good stewards of taxpayer dollars. And I want you to talk to me about two things. Number one, the increase in cost, which was addressed and, and what that would be, what that looks like and why you think that that's worth um, the investment. And then number two, I think that you know the GEMT funding or the money that's coming back because of um, our filing, you know, is going to be critical to this moving forward. Now, whether GEMT is renewed and continues long term, hey, that's out of our control. But I think that that is going to be critical moving forward, and people are going to need to, to be trained to be compliant and making sure that we're keeping up on that side of it. Um, what assurance do you have that we'll be able to do that? So it's kind of a two-part okay. question on the finances side. So specific to the GEMT, um, 
you know, first of all, this proposal doesn't include the positions of compliance officer and director. Um, and Director Hayden is the one who handles our GEMT submissions and all that kind of stuff, along with finance and uh, our administration and several others. But fire departments across the state of Iowa are, are doing GEMT. Um, it's uh, a program that departments across the state rely on to make up that difference between Medicare and Medicaid and what this service actually costs. So um, my, you know, I guess what I would tell you there is that that will continue and we will, um, we always operate with at least uh, a next person up attitude. So we make sure that we have people trained to do, multiple people trained to do any job uh, on this department. And that would be the same case with GEMT. It is a complex thing, and let me tell you, Jim does a great job, wonderful job, and I thank Jim for that. Um, he goes above and beyond on it, and um, I would think moving forward, that'll stay the same. And then to the second part of that question, then, if you could address is just, why is this increased in cost, you know, depending on what that's going to be, if you could just at least bring to light what you anticipate that being and why that's worth the investment. Yep. So you've been provided a little bit of uh, background on the, the money differences. Firefighter benefit packages um, overall cost slightly more. Um, that is somewhat offset by the reduction we would foresee uh, with testing processes, training processes, outfitting people with gear, uh, those kinds of things. Um, and so there's still a difference of initially what we estimate to be about $36,000, I believe it is. Um, I think, I mean, this, what, what this staffing shortage means is we have one of our four frontline ambulances not in service as much. So to me, if we can put that frontline that fourth ambulance in service 50% more often for $36,000 to start, to me that's uh, well worth the cost. But again, that's a decision I understand. You guys have to make a lot of tough financial decisions. Um, and I think as the mayor said, once the whole thing, if we were to roll this whole thing over to fire, immediately it would be $250,000 or something like that. Um, going to come up and add to that. Okay. Um, Teresa Fetch, Finance Director. Um, I just want to give um, exact information on that. The annual conversion cost actually would be about $232,000. Um, so I just wanted to clarify all that. In. Once it's complete. All in, yes. Once they all convert. So. And that's spread out over, do we know how many? I would say that's going to be spread out over the career of our EMS division people that want to stay. So we, we literally have some, you know, um, younger people who will probably be here 25 plus years, I would assume. So um, it'll trickle in over time, but it will be slightly more overall. So we'll be impacted by the budget increases incrementally. Yep. And as he mentioned, as uh, um, Chief mentioned earlier, each one of these um, will come forward to you for an approval. So each time we change the complement, you guys will be um, approving that complement change. Each and time what that forward. means is each time that someone would <coughs> hire or change, then it would come before us and we change. Is that what you're meaning? Yep. Yes. Yep. So initially for this, as far as the... What is the is the cost of the thirty six then for the four or what do you Correct. anticipate? Yeah, yep. that's what that is. And then, Chief, your some of your justification is saying, well, then we would be able to actually have another ambulance in the rot in the rotation on a certain percentage basis, whatever that would be as far as staffing. We estimate that to be about fifty percent. And the other benefit, I guess, to that amount of money would be the fact that um, there's a national fire protection standard that we currently don't meet for staffing on a fire ground. Um, by having firefighters in those ambulances, that allows us to meet that staffing standard. So it's something that we would be moving towards, having people that can operate in different ways on the fire ground that would help us achieve compliance with that standard. That's just another uh, side thing that we have considered. Well, Neil, did you want to say something? I noticed you have a big stack of papers there. I just, <laughs> hold if on. You, if you vote on, I'm not the smartest guy, but if you vote on 38, this process is kicking in. Yes. You can tell me, well, 
And that's my problem. There are still people, good people, that want to be paramedics. How many firefighters are paramedics today out of your, out of how many firefighters? We have 111 firefighters, 33 paramedics EMTs. Okay. Well, it's important to me. Well, everybody has to have an EMT. Right. But I mean in the EMS division. It's important to me that we have enough paramedics because they can do more right. at my house when I'm having a problem. Absolutely. Yes. Against an EMT, they know a lot more than I do. But once you kick this in, you're saying, kids, if you're going to WIT, you're not working in Sioux City. That's the end of the line for you if you, if you want to be a paramedic and not be a firefighter. That's what you're saying. Well, again, I think there's some other career opportunities, but it certainly would be more limiting. Yes. And there are some that are joint, right? Or are both of those programs, they're a firefighter as well as a paramedic, or they yes, are a paramedic? Yes, a lot of firefighters are paramedics. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's there's a degree it. program also. But it's just a matter of if they didn't want to do that or do the bo both of them. And as far as other communities, because that was one thing that I know I brought up and was looking into, I mean, do they have those positions carved out, or is this for any other community that has went to more of this model, is this kind of in line with that, that then they are the firefighters as well as paramedics and they just hold to that standard? Here, there's a lot of different models across the United States. There's nothing that's standardized, but certainly what we've seen in Iowa is a shift towards uh, fire departments providing the emergency ambulance service. So in, do you have anticipation that we would have fewer paramedics on the streets then? I do not. Not a requirement as a fireman to be a paramedic. It is not at this time. But would it be a correct? But would we have minimum levels of paramedics out there? Can't or guarantee no? it unless, unless the firefighter chooses to be a paramedic. Okay. You can't guarantee that unless you put a minimum staffing in. I think we pay more for paramedics. We do, but that's a voluntary thing for them to to go get in order to be paid that. Right. So you, you have no guarantee at the end of the day that that will be the case, which is a little scary to me, but I'm glad you got that many, so that's good. Go ahead. Uh, Neil Paulson, 4530 Manor Circle. Also president, Sioux City Professional Firefighters Association, local number seven of the International Association of Firefighters. Just want to start by saying Local 7 supports Chief Everett in his RCA proposal. Uh, we recently had a meeting, special meeting with members. We had 70 members attend, and it was unanimous vote in support of him. Uh, understaffing has become a real issue within the EMS division. Many times personnel are taken off suppression rigs during a call to supplement transport of a patient to the hospital via our Medic 5, our southern rig. That position is critical to fire response when a structure fire occurs. Sometimes that engine returns to service with two people, other times it follows the ambulance to the hospital to per pick up their personnel. The southern districts already have an increased response time due to distance of other apparatus. Due to the increased call volume, Medic 5 has become a necessity to be staffed. Recently, OT has been authorized to fill these positions with fire personnel when necessary, and many times not enough EMS personnel are on the uh, overtime list. Also, many times EMS personnel have been mandated for shifts due to low staffing. No medic unit available response numbers lately. Uh, we've had 25 already this month where there was not an ambulance available for a call. Um, a lot of times those are, are picked up in, in a few minutes, uh, but it, overall it alludes to the numbers that we just don't have enough ambulances on the street at the time. Uh, some of the requirements of the firefighter, uh, EMTB at a minimum, uh, we have 12 months of supervised probation with additional EMS training involved. That's kind of an ever evolving topic that our training is changing with the times. Uh, we did add more EMS training in the last couple years. Uh, currently it's three months uh, for an EMTB on the EMS division. They have a six month city probation and then kind of a three month of a, a shadowing deal where they ride third on an ambulance. Um, we have, uh, for a firefighter, we have a career-oriented mindset with a dedication to fire department culture. Uh, it's not a stepping stone for our personnel. Uh, many have served careers over 30 years. Uh, just some points that we'd like to point out. The current fighter fire complement, we have 33 paramedics, 20 feet, 23 advanced EMTs, and 51 EMTs. 
Uh, we have a waiting list for qualified applicants for existing openings if the RCA is approved. So we have nine currently that can, are available to be um, employed. Uh, every day that we wait is another day of understaffing and another day that Medic 5 in Morningside is not staffed. Also, losing applicants to other departments or careers. Re recently, we lost two to Sioux Falls, uh, one to Des Moines. Uh, we've had 120% turnover since the EMS uh, division's inception. I believe we have five original members that started six years ago. Other than that, everybody has come on after the fact. Um, this is not a new idea, having fire-based EMS. Departments across the state have already implemented it or they're transitioning currently. I know it, uh, according to the International Association of Fire Chiefs uh, brochure, they support the fire-based EMS model and there's about 97% of the top 200 metros that have moved to fire-based EMS. Uh, this RCA is asking for four positions to be converted so they can be filled. These are four vacant positions. No one is at risk of losing their job. It is not Local 7's position to take anyone's job or force anyone out. It is in the best interest of each and every citizen that we have a fully staffed department. And Local 7 is addressing safety and cost concerns regarding staffing and turnover. A vote yes on this RCA is a vote in the confidence in the leadership of this department and its chief. Now, come on. We all get a right to an opinion here. We all get a right to our opinion because we come from at these at different ways. So don't say if I vote no on something, I'm voting no on the leadership of, of City Hall here. That's, a, that's not the way it works for me. Well, no, I think he's just saying. No, that's exactly what he's saying. The fire chief and the leader of the union. But I'm not saying that's your opinion. I'm saying that's how I view it. Okay. The vote yes is to support us, the department. Any questions? No. What, which station isn't staffed? Uh, currently, we run Medic 5 staffing about 20% 20, 20 of the time. Um, previous times, we've run that with a solo personnel. Recently, there's been OT authorized to fill that to a, a two-person complement. Uh, that's only when personnel are available. And like I said, that's about 20% of the time right now. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Shannon Sargent, Pat, Pat's union president. Um, so the EMS is under our union, and of course we're, um, I'm a little confused, I'm not quite understand, I, I don't quite understand how those four jobs will eventually, through retirement or attrition, are we going to refill those positions? So I'm a little confused, I have a lot of questions about this. And I'd like to bring up um, Liz, and she's a, an actual lead paramedic, and have her address this, because she's got some concerns. I work at the Arts Center, so I'd rather have her address this, as far as a concern. Be, one of the things is, is losing those positions in our union will weaken our union. Losing those um, lead paramedic positions or EMT lead medic positions is also going to hurt the leadership of the EMS. Because right now, that, um, and it's kind of interesting because I, I feel like that a lot of the EMTs and, and um, the EMS side, they end up going to become firefighters, but not all of them want to become firefighters. So I feel like it will eliminate the EMS side eventually. And so well, that is a concern for our union. If, the, if you vote for 38, it definitely will. As, as a person retires, it'll be filled with a firefighter position. Well, you'll, you'll whittle away at it. Right. And it weakens the, the EMS side, it weakens also our union. Right. And so Liz will come up and, and maybe talk a little bit more about uh, the training and whatnot, things that I'm not familiar with. Good evening to you all on council. My name is Liz Ford. I live at 2324 Pueblo Drive. My position, I'm employed with Sioux City Fire and the Vice President of Ask Me Pats 2796. I thank you for having an open discussion. I believe that's what we need to have. There's a lot of concern and questions on a subject that is very critical to what I believe is our full community. I am a paramedic with Sioux City Fire Rescue. I have been in the EMS system for a few days, 42 years to be exact. 
I, like many others, have dedicated my life to a profession of caring for emergency medical needs of our citizens. Before you is a resolution to make changes to the future staffing of the EMS division due to shortages created by some leaving for other increased education endeavors, which I think is wonderful, and others leaving to become because they want to be firefighters. I applaud that wholeheartedly. I want everybody to do what they want to do. Those people have chosen that because that's their goal and that's what their life goal is, is to do that, not EMS. And that's great. But there are many people that do not want to be EMS. I certainly acknowledge that there's others that don't want to be firefighters as well. I myself could not do their job. The numbers have gone down after the horrible word of COVID. We are well aware of that. However, we have seen a bit of an uptake. We currently have, from what I'm understanding from uh, Terry Regaler, who teaches, and some other people that teach, that we have five that want to apply as EMTs, and all five want to be paramedics. Um, one of the other ones has three, and another one has two. We had six on the last list. I get it. It's not 500 people, but we are gaining. Those people want to do these jobs, just as they want to be firefighters. Classes are, have people in them, and these people want that as their profession. Each division is a specialized craft. It is our expertise, dedication, and leadership that focuses and guides new EMTs and medics for the future to take care of us all. Just looking at the experience is amazing since the group that transitioned in 2018 has well over 200 years of experience. I would hate to see that go away for any reason. That is what encourages and employs the younger ones coming up to be that experience. And I want that to stay for our community. This resolution calls to fill EMT open positions with firefighters through attrition starting now. As the chief said, we have four positions that are open, but we don't have an active list. Um, and not trying to correct, I thought originally we had six on the list that we have five in probation and one was choosing to hold off till she finished paramedic school, was what I was told, and wants to do the job. There are some that did leave EMS to go to fire as well, and I understand that. They are floaters and probies, as you can see, there's numerous ones. I want that for them. I want that for our community. I think there's more to discuss here. This plan also raises some issues, which we've actually discussed. But the first and major one I have is that we have two separate unions. And that goes back previously, and that is a fact. Not a discussion or dispute, it's a fact. Um, our people are represented by us. Local 7 represents the firefighters. We have always had that cohesive relationship. I will tell you for a fact that in 42 years, I was here when the city hired a consultant years ago who came in, evaluated the system the way we work it, and left with the decision that the, it should stay the way it is. We have a cohesive group. We work together. We don't want to lose those positions. The other issue is, as we brought up community, what happens to the people that want to be EMTs and paramedics, not firefighters? What do we do with them? They don't really necessarily all want to work in a clinic or a hospital. They want to work in emergency services. We understand that the triad of E911 has reduced. Everybody has that issue. But I think we need to come up with better ideas for recruitment. Our recruitment has not exactly been EMS directed. There are other options out there, just as there are other options to come up with a solution for this to hire. I think fire should be going and geared towards fire. I think EMS should be trying to recruit EMS. There's a reason for that. They have specialties. Each one, like I said, is a craft, and we have to respect those crafts, and I certainly respect theirs. I'm going to have you wrap it up, Liz, okay? Yep, yep, certainly will. No, I, mean, I think we've you can covered, finish what you got to say. Well, I think we've covered most of the things. You talked about the G&T money. I have a concern that if we don't keep the standards up, 
That's a lot of money. My understanding was, I believe it was $3 million last year. Um, Director Hayden and the Chief can certainly speak to that much better than I can, but we do have to maintain those standards. The one other thing that I worry about in the future is diversity and that changing and going down. I believe our city and seminar is working very hard to keep that up. I don't want to see that go down. Yes, some of our people, if this goes to a firefighter only, they, obviously they want to be here, but to some of these people we want to make sure keep their careers. Mine's on a short time list, but these people are protected and cared for by us, and I want them to have the careers that they want to have for as long as they want them. They have expertise, and I think that needs to be focused on. Finally, we have had been given numerous awards for our care in this city of Sioux City for partnerships we have with Iowa Donor Network to receiving four years of awards for Mission Lifeline for Cardiac Care, top gold mission awards. We have a great system. We have it for a reason, because we work together. But I think each side has its points and its concern, but I still say that there needs to be more conversation. There's options out there. We had a bit short notice, as uh, Matthew, you brought up, um, and not a whole lot of time to discuss it, and I think there's more things that need to be discussed. But as I said, going back, AFSCME and Local 7 are two separate unions, and we need to take care of what we need to take care of within our group. I do thank you for your time, and I hope you would consider that all. Liz, can I ask one question, sure. if you don't mind? Yes, sir. Um, the one question I have is something that I hadn't necessarily thought about, and I didn't know if you guys had a meeting, and, and maybe I didn't know about it, with, with the hiring committee, and talking through some of those different options, because that's kind of been coming to light is, look, we've had these hiring problems in the past, mm -hmm. and I have talked to the chief about you know ideas and what we could do, and we have. We increased the mileage differential. We increased the pay scale. We increased all these different things. I felt, as a member of council, that I was like, Gosh, what else can we do, you know, in coming to people and saying, like, let's figure out, like, what is going to get us fully staffed? What can we do? Did you feel like we exhausted those possibilities? Or now, you know, with this coming to light, I'm hearing, oh, well, we could have been doing this or we should have been doing that. And was, was that met with resistance or just wasn't heard or wasn't thought of or... Help me understand, like, why is some of this stuff... No, I don't think that we did everything we could. Um, we did a few things that were wonderful for it. Um, we know that nationally there is a shortage of EMS personnel. There's a shortage of yeah. firefighters, of sheriffs. And that's just it. I mean, the number is going down. I get that, Exactly. Too. But I think that the recruitment needs to... I am not on the recruiting group. I have gone and spoken to one class. Um, when I was done with that class... Um, we had three that wanted to apply from it. Um, I have had a call from that same instructor who's waiting for me to tell her when application's open, she has two more that want to apply. Um, I think it needs to be geared. I think firefighters go out and gear their recruitment for fire, but I think EMS needs to do that. No disrespect to anybody, but I don't think I'm in a position to go recruit firefighters by any means. I am for the department, but my goal is EMS because that's my expertise as fire is for fire. Um, there is many options out there. I've talked to a few other people in different departments. They have some great ideas, and I think those ideas need to come to the forefront to try. Anyone else? Dan had to leave, and he said that he would like to defer until February 5th, but it's not necessary if, if you guys are ready to vote. So Support a deferral. Huh? Support a deferral. I think at least it would give everybody some more time to talk. It's, it seems like there was a lot of people that were not in the loop on this one, and, and I don't want to seem like we're just going to rush right through it. Um, just this morning, we received an email with, you know, more concerns regarding it. I didn't even have an opportunity to read completely through that email. So I don't think I would be comfortable moving forward on a vote 
um, for, for 38 until I have some additional time to do some studying. I, I just want to say a few things, I guess, Chief, and give you at least an idea of where my thoughts are, right? Is that fair? So, um, and I tell you what, I've, I've had more conversations about this in the last week than I ever imagined I probably would have, but I, uh, I came into this meeting prepared to vote. I had, I thought what I had done was my due diligence of reaching out to both sides and trying to have these conversations. But I understand ask for a deferral, I, and I usually try to respect those because we did, you know, there has been more concerns coming to light, and I think it's important to talk through that. I get that. What I want to share is something that I'm continuing to see in City Hall and well, in just city departments, I'm not saying just in this building, right? Obviously, you all are throughout the community. But one thing that we need to continue to improve upon, and I'm asking our leadership, you included, heck, me included, in this, that we need to do better, is having more open and honest conversations with all parties involved. And I, I honestly, I put this on myself. I, in, I, gosh, I've had a lot of conversations, as I said. In every one of those conversations, I said that it was my fault too. That I should have encouraged this. I should have thought about this. And we have went through it with other topics that were fairly contentious where I thought I had learned my lesson and, and would have encouraged this and simply didn't. Because I do think that there are a lot of people that felt like they were in the dark about this. And you're exactly right. I mean, I've joked, right? Like, I remember back in the Lenny days, he'd been talking to me about this for years, right? So people knew that this was an option. People were throwing out, people were pushing. But I don't think that especially the EMS side of house knew that we were this close, you know, or knew that there was actually a deal being written up or negotiated or anything like that. And then all of a sudden your update comes and everyone feels blindsided and, and my heart has to go out to them because I, to Matthew's point, I mean, he's experiencing in his workplace. I think that then people become defensive, they shut down, they don't wanna have the conversation and they just worry that they're at risk. And if they're not at risk, maybe you know they're like Liz and feel that they're more secure at the sunset of their career rather than the outset of it. I feel for those individuals that are unsure of that rather than having an open and honest conversation I think if we would have went through some of those steps and brought people like them on to, well, it can do one of two things, right? Like it can definitely stall a conversation where people just dig their heels in, or it can be a more fruitful conversation where hopefully we say, look, we have to address this. We have to solve this problem. We need another ambulance out on our streets, not missing these calls, you know, or having delays in getting to them, not missing them, but having delays in getting to them. We all have a vested interest in the best service of our community. We could have had a better conversation of bringing everyone so at least they felt heard and said, these are the things that I really think we need to think about if we are going down this path. I equated it in some of the conversations that I had this week of saying that, look, I've heard this for a number of years since joining council and then it was coming through and, and more clear that we needed to do something with a sense of urgency after the pandemic. It felt like it was a moving train. And I thought we're not gonna stop maybe a moving train, but how can we try to adjust it to make sure that it's the best possible outcome and that people at least feel comfortable moving forward in that direction, right? And that's where I wish I had done a better job and I wish our leadership would continue to do a better job of trying to make sure we're having these open and honest conversations. And I think I, I take ownership. It starts with me too. I'm the one behind the bench. But, um, and so I don't know during this deferral time um, if you can have some of those honest conversations and, and be open to that. I think a lot of this stuff is is somewhat negotiated. I don't think the ink is dry by any stretch of the imagination, but I would just encourage you and encourage leadership to reach out. 
um, uh, to the other side of house. I mean, I look people like I was people like Liz. I mean, come on, I've I've known Liz for a long time. You know, Liz has provided care for me. Gosh, Sarah Harris and I were talking <laughs> yesterday about her providing care one time when. I overheat. I have a lot of medical things that go on in my life, but I've had a lot of firefighters that have been there for me as well. I respect Jim Hayden and that side of house a great, great, great deal. And I've literally had my life in their hands, as the mayor said, a couple of times too. And so it's one of those where I want to make sure that we give them and their profession the respect that they deserve and at least are hearing out some of those concerns to ensure that we have a smooth transition because the one thing I've hated going back, like now we're at the point where I wish we had a, done a better job having the conversation. The one thing that I haven't enjoyed throughout this whole time, and at times it seems that it's been better, is almost like a sibling rivalry, right? Between EMS and firefighter. And, and I'm told that that's not something that's unique to Sioux City or unique to our area, but um, that there is just kind of that, I mean, and, and sometimes you hope that it's jovial, like between police officers and firefighters, I get that. But I don't, I didn't want anyone ever thinking that they were less than when they were a part of this team because we were truly one unit trying to make the best of a bad situation. I remember when we took it over. We've been trying to do that since day one. And uh, I guess, you know, I can always do better communicating. I think all of us can, but I think a lot of these people would say they hear from me maybe too much, right? So um, there's not a thing that's been raised tonight by either side that hasn't been discussed. I've met with their union twice. I've met with this union several times, met with you guys. Um, I'm completely open to any meetings. I've never turned down a meeting. Um, and I guess between now and whenever, I, I don't know what new is gonna come up that, that hasn't been addressed. Sometimes people just disagree with, with right. something, right? And so you're gonna to continue to get correspondence that says, well, this isn't right. Well, it's the same thing we've talked about. Yeah. And so, and, and I agree, and I think that's fair. And that's what I was saying, is that it's like at least the opportunity okay. to be heard and say, these are the things, if it's going this, if we're on a moving train, I wanna make sure that it's at least the best it could be. And I'll give you an example. I've had a lot of these conversations and tried thinking of what else we could make sure to be intentional about if this proceeds, right? And one of those things is that I think, I do anticipate there being some firefighters that are not as excited to be on an ambulance. Like the type that maybe are like, oh my gosh, I'm, I, I came to be a firefighter. I'm excited to be a firefighter. What am I doing? I don't wanna just be on an ambulance. Put me on a rig, right? Like, Look, I'm not stupid. There could be those people. You hope they're in the minority. But what I would say is it's going to be, you're going to have to be intentional over that year-long probation period to make sure that they understand just how essential that skill set is and what they're doing is. Because you have to make sure to prioritize that and say, that's just as important now as your job. You know what I mean? Like they are, they are the, sim the same. And I think that if you can be intentional throughout that year time period of saying, look, we're dedicating a lot of time to you learning the fire skill and you already graduated with a basic knowledge of EMT, but we need to make sure you understand our protocol our compliance, our forms, what needs to be done, and also what it means to be a part of the team and say, yeah, I'm willing to hop on the box, like I'm willing to go do that. I think that's just as important. So that's even, I mean, something, heck, just in the conversations that I've had that I think would maybe make the EMS side of house feel a little better is just that over the course of that probationary period, you're being intentional about valuing and the, that skill set and encouraging your members and, and firefighters just to know that that is how essential that is. I agree with you. And I will say, though, that we have some that are just as dedicated on both sides. I agree. And th that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do know that. But our I probate hope you know. will change, um, certainly, to reflect the change in duties. What's that, Chief? I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. The, the fire probation will, will change slightly to reflect that change in duties, of course. We're going to have to have uh, additional training and so forth. That, uh, and we've been doing that for some time now. I think uh, 
President Paulson alluded to the fact that we've changed probation here a year or two ago with more emphasis on EMS, but um, that will have to continue. I just wanted to air that. I think I got out everything that I needed to say. I'm sorry if I went on a little long, but I just, I've thought a lot about this and it's, you know, it's. So we've got one individual left on this list that we have to extend an offer to before we can put out for another list, right? To certify for EMT. Right, she, she would have to decline one more time uh, to, kill, to kill this list. When are we intending to reach out to this individual? I'd have to check with um, our admin. Um, I think HR recommended a couple months, but she's been offered here maybe a month ago or so. So I'll have to check. And this is uh, <clears throat> urgent in, in terms of the staffing and the overtime, but not an emergency. So if you guys want to put it off, I understand you have difficult decisions to make, and we're not trying to hide from any conversations. We're not trying to hide from explaining why we think this is the right thing to do. I'll sit down with anybody that wants to between now and then, um, but I'm more than happy to, to do what you guys want to do moving forward on this. I just think we need to do something. Well, I can tell you how I'm going to vote. I don't, it's, um, I feel like I can't even remember because my brain is dead. The guy <laughs> going to split the baby in half. I, I'm for 39, which I think you can do without doing 38. I'm not for 38. I will never be for 38. I think you have to have a limit of, until you, you know, Chief, not being critical, but we've done everything that your department asked us to do to try to get more people. And every time we were told stuff, this will help, this will help. And it still doesn't help. I think I've also said there's not a magic bullet, right? So I, each of I know, those, each but of every time helped. we've done it, and now the residency requirement's been blown out for everybody, which I didn't support, but we did it basically for your department. So I, I'm going to move we defer 38. Second. We're deferring to the fifth? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Waters? Aye. Moore? Oh, apologies. O'Kane? Okay. Aye. Shainer? Aye. Scott. All right. Thank you, Council. 39 is a resolution amending the statement of authorized personnel complement by deleting four EMS medical technician positions and a full time equivalent part time paramedic position and adding four firefighter positions. I'm going to move that. Second. And I'm going to vote for that because it's critical that we do have care and we don't have time to get people. In. But I'm not going to guarantee I'm ever voting. For all three, I'm not gonna. I mean, the rest of them probably will, but I don't think it's the right approach. So I know you guys don't agree with that, and we've disagreed in the past, and we'll disagree in the future, I guess. So are we le voting electronically? I'm gonna call this one. Okay. O'Kane? Aye. Shaner? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Item 10D is a resolution approving a third amendment to the development and lease agreements with Oracle Aviation. I'll move that. Is there a second? Second. O'Kane? Aye. Shaner? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Abstain conflict of interest. Citizen concerns. Any citizen would like to come forward, please state your name and address for the record. And. You're losing your hot I should, have listened. I should have paid attention to you the You could agenda. have brought a $2.90 bologna sandwich, but go ahead. <laughs> Cheap entertainment. <laughs> I'm Steve Nelson, uh, owner developer of the Benson Building at 705 Douglas. I'm here today to ask the city to do something with the lamb production building. And my suggestion is to tear it down. I've sent some pictures to Daryl Bullock and other people, but the structure of the roof has collapsed. And it's open to the whole building. There's, there's nothing left on that. There is, there's a third of the building, the roof is still there. As we start to open up our building at the Benson Building, and, and when we decided to buy it, part of that was the historical preservation of that building was gonna happen. In five years, nothing's happened. In fact, the building's deteriorated to a worse condition. 
So as we start to open up and we're showing our apartments for lease, that's a big distraction with this roof being open. The, there's an air conditioning unit ready to fall in. The building's just unsafe, obviously. So I'm asking, and I, I know they're, they haven't even been able to pay their $350,000 that you guys gave them or lend them for the building. They're supposed to have all their financing done last fall or last spring when they gave you a spreadsheet and nothing's been done. I would love to save that building, but I think it's too far gone. It's way too far gone for structurally and, and, and mold and so forth. So um, I, I know Marty was working with Diana and, and now their, their thoughts are, I talked to Diana today, the owner of the building, that they're talking about tearing it down as well to the floor and starting over. I'm really skeptical about that because I just don't think they have the funding to do the project. So if we're gonna go down that road, I would ask either A, I know it's red tagged for years, I don't know why it's not torn down now, but either A, tear it down. I think if the city has the mortgage, I'm assuming you guys are a certificate holder on the insurance certificate, right? File a claim off the, the damage of the roof to help remove the building. Because the 350, I think, is gone. But secondly, the, if we are going to keep it, they're going to keep going. As with any of these grants that we get, they have a readiness that we have to provide, which is cash, bank financing, building permit, plans, and so forth. If we're gonna proceed, I'd like to see that in place from that group to save that building and continue with the project as an alternative. And I don't think it should be a year. It should, they've been working on this for five years. This should be like a 60, 90 day window for them to produce the documents, the financing, and the ability to put this project to move forward one way or another. If they don't do a historical preservation, they lose all of those tax credits, right. which is a large sum of money. So I think even their resources are depleted further than if they start from scratch. They don't have a parking lot in this building. So the sustainability of this project, I just don't think it's going to happen. And we guys have been kicking this can down the road for a lot of years. So I am asking you not to renew there, if they come back, and I think it's February, they ask you guys to not have them pay the 350000 to give them an extension. So I'm asking to deny that next month and to move forward with the demolition of the building or produce the financing and the funds that show you can move the project forward. I've got $23 million in my project. It's not fair to me. You have the law enforcement building you're going to tear down. You're gonna ask for developers to spend millions and millions of dollars with that building sitting in there in that condition. It's not fair, it's not right. So I'm asking you to move that forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You didn't build your parking lot big enough for us to do anything. <laughs> Come on, I could do, but they probably wouldn't like the rent that I Yeah. Charge. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and you chose tonight. I got something <laughs> real simple. Keith Baker, 2101 Nash, Sioux City. I got an issue with one of your plow trucks. A few years ago, I called the field services office because they plowed in my driveway. I know we had a lot of snow doing their job. So they went up Paul Street. I went out and seen how much snow was in my drive. I was walking out by my pickup, and I seen him coming back down the street. He intentionally come back on my side and put more snow in my driveway. I seen him do it. He intentionally done this to me. So I went down to the field services office and said something to them about it. And the gal down there, I asked him for the supervisor. He wasn't there. She said, what's the issue? So I drew her a map. I will never forget to this day how it happened because the plow truck, truck driver couldn't see me as short as I am alongside my truck. He couldn't see me. He'd done it. 
and she didn't like it. So her, her boss come in. He didn't like it either, what I had to say to him. So they done it again. They, I thought maybe it was water under the bridge, because whenever they'd come by my house on Paul, they were careful, you know, to go on the drive. That's good. I know they had a job to do. I'm not taking that away from them. But last Friday night, they intentionally went in my driveway, get about two or three feet, turned into my driveway and put another big pile of snow in there. And I said, oh no, not this again. So I called the cops. He come out and seen it. In fact, I took pictures of it. I said, I wanted him to see this, what they'd done. He said, well, maybe they'd done it to move it off the street. And I said, you know what? They'd done it on purpose, because I said, walk across the street, because they drove straight down the other side, like normal. They'd done it intentionally. So I want one of you guys to call the head of field services to tell them to take that red sticker off of their map, off of my home, and quit doing this. But then me and the neighbor were out cleaning the snow back out of the driveway Friday night after I talked to the cop. And a, and a plow truck, city plow truck, drove down the street. I think the supervisor of the cops was called to come down and clean my driveway out because he was looking for my home particularly. He was driving real slow. And he stopped and cleaned out the drive. We were real nice, real cordial. And he the gladly police stopped done and it. cleaned out the drive or the plow What's truck driver? Who stopped and cleaned out the driveway? A city truck. I think, oh, truck. I think okay. a supervisor from the police department was notified of this. I think the officer, in fact, the officer, when I told him what happened, he said, you know what? City doesn't like to hear about things like this from citizens. That's what his comment was to me. A cop told me that because I told him what happened. Can you so, give me your address again, Keith? What's that? Can you give me your address again? Because I'm going to follow 2101 up. 2101 Nash Street. Okay. Is all I'm asking. I know they have a job to do. I'm not taking that away. But quit doing this to me. I didn't do anything wrong. Is all I done was say something. Is that wrong? Well, I can tell you you're not the only guy they've done it to, but huh? from personal experience, I can tell you you're, they're not, you're not the only guy they've done it to. They've done it to me in the past. They don't anymore. Well, by God, Bob, well, I slipped him a 20 to something. do that. Uh -huh. I slipped him a 20 to do that. I'm sure you did because the guy went down at the end of the street and turned around and came back. And, and you know well, what today, what they've done, 20. Bob? They drove down the left side heading back towards Riverside Boulevard. They should have been on the right side. That's how intentional they done it. Because I would stand there watching them. I know, but the new guy, I will say, they haven't done that for a while on my, in my case. But, the, but Pat is really good, and I'm sure he did send somebody back out because they buried garbage cans for an older guy that couldn't get them, and he sent somebody up. I was going to go myself, but he got somebody up there. So we'll talk with him because Pat... Pat's doing a very good job of taking Patrick care of it. Patrick has been very responsive. He's been very responsive. gotten calls into our office for so, things like this. So well, you know Bob, what? Well, I'm Bob. 75 years old. I can't do this much longer. Yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk to him. We'll let him know. And I just want it to end. All right. I can see they have their job to do. Right. But don't do it on purpose. Yeah. Yep. All right, we're on. We'll let him know. We'll let him know. Thank you, guys. All right. That's all I'm asking. Thanks for staying around. Huh? Thanks for staying two and a half hours. <laughs> hey, you know what, Bob? I wasn't going to say anything because they were good enough to come back and do it. And I told the wife, I says, things are resolved. But when they done it twice today, that was it. Yeah. All right, man. We'll Thanks. get on it. Thank Thanks, buddy. Anyone else? Mr. O'Kane. I'm going to try and power through these three minutes on the, on the clock. <laughs> so, uh, first off, thank you to the NAACP and everyone that was involved for another amazing MLK Day celebration. Um, I, there was a lot of great speakers. I, it was a great event. For me, Dr. King's words uh, really resonated as they were read by Mr. Ike Rayford. That, yeah. that was a powerful part. 
Um, and just the way he built up with the crescendo and everything, um, and he read them in such a heartfelt manner that it was, it was hard to miss. Um, thank you to the Local 7. Uh, I know many of us attended the, the smoker event that they have every year. Um, I, I wish I could say that that was one night where there wasn't a fire, but I drove past the fire on my way to the event. So um, thankful to our firefighters for always being there um, because they're, they're always there. Um, thank you to the warming shelter. We heard from Shayla Moore today. Under her leadership, um, they pivoted to help allow more individuals out from the cold. One of the first things she did was make sure to build up the stock of cots that they have. Um, and so we've been dealing with blizzard conditions and she's done a lot to make sure that everybody has a place to stay. Um, I, I do think that that's a, a, a valid point that, that she brought up and that in the past couple of years, we've had several structure fires and we've had several fires under bridges that have caused a countless amount of damage that I, I think we could really offset by simply providing some housing for people. Um, the, uh, and just like Ms. Richner said at the beginning of the meeting, uh, Thursday from six to eight at the museum is the Human Rights Commission and the Siouxland Coalition Against Human Trafficking and they'll be presenting on human trafficking in Siouxland, which we have taken great strides to reduce, which is always nice to hear. And that's everything. Julie. I have nothing today. Matthew. Ready to close. I mean, <laughs> Alex, it's, not, <laughs> it's been a long, long meeting. <laughs> and with that, don't fall out of your chair, but I have nothing today, Mayor. Hey, I have one. I know that it, I won't get this done, but I wish we could put a priority Everybody thinks that the council members and the mayor get their street moved. The reason I get my snow moved is because it's a bus route. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I want to say, if you want to take that bus route and take it down Indian Hill so those buses go out Outer Belt and don't come by my house, Great. I would love that. I can get. A, I got a four-wheel pickup. Yeah. I can always get out. No doubt. I don't want citizens to think that I get priority one street. So I'm asking you to check with the school district and Mike and see if you can move that those buses out of my neighborhood. I'm okay with it. All of your neighbors. You can have yeah. all my neighbors be mad. At I was now. just gonna say. I was like, uh, yeah, of course. You're not. Get I'm, up. I'm tired of listening. To, I mean, reading on Facebook that somehow I get a priority. In, when I first got into council in 1986, council members were priority one streets. We used to be a gravel road and we were priority three, then we got moved to one because I moved there. But that's not the case anymore. Now it's bus routes and that that are priority one. And I, I just want Alex the public to understand that. I'm, I'm and I also want one, the public to understand I think I'm on a one that I met with waste management with Bob and we know we're behind and the best thing you can do is call waste management. Era's doing a great job working with them and you know, hopefully we're going to get caught up, but. And you can put trash bags out beside your trolley when you put it out. They okay. will take them. And and people need to understand if, if it's a real problem and that they're on a paved alley that does get the garbage picked up there, yep. they have a right to take it down. I know it's hard, but you do have the right to take it down to the next street and they will dump it there too. So it's not like they're intentionally forgetting people. No. And Mayor, I lied. I, I thought of, you talked too no, long. You, now you, I thought of something. Can't go you, back. You, you can't no, go you back, talked Alex. too We're long. Moving Sorry. Forward. I got a basketball game. Go ahead. No, the one thing I, I say this, I could say this till I'm blue in the face, and I don't know who's tuning in and listening. Dolly, come on, put it front page headline. It's the leading story. Come on, we haven't had enough to cover in this meeting, so <laughs> make sure this is the leading story. Please encourage your neighbors, your yourselves, just a reminder, get out and clear the sidewalks. I, we all have a responsibility to clean them. I have to ask my dear friends for help clearing mine if Casey's unable to do it. And I just would encourage everyone to take that seriously. If you're a business owner or a homeowner or just own property, please remember to do this. And not only to do that, look, I know Keith is frustrated that his driveway is getting blocked in. You know what I get frustrated and I got a call from another person that's dealing with it is when the plows go around the corner and 
the corner doesn't get cleared off. The ramp space doesn't get cleared off. It's it's a waste. It might not a, even might as well not even be a side because now I'm going down the middle of the road because I can't get onto the sidewalk. And it happens at far too many businesses than I could tell you. Um, and I've dealt with it a lot, but I just, I received a call from a high schooler that uses a wheelchair and she's pretty distraught about just even being able to get around in her community. And it's something that I just, I hate seeing people try to navigate <laughs> sidewalks that aren't cleared off. And I hate seeing these curb cuts that aren't clear so people can't get safely on and off of sidewalks. It's, I hate being the type of person that's calling in my neighbors or calling and talking to them. You have my word, if I had the ability to manage a, a plow of some type or a snowblower, hey, I'd bundle my butt up and be right out there maybe with you. But I just, we gotta do right by our neighbors and think of other people. It's not necessarily if you're using the sidewalk. Think of that about the kids that are going to school. Think about the people that are trying to get to a bus stop. We need to be considerate of our neighbors and the amount of snow we got is crazy. Just try to help people out. I have heard some folks and read on social media, they wonder why can't we get snow gates to ones go by the driveways, and right? Stuff, yeah. And the corners, et cetera. And I did do a little follow up on that. It's the actual maintainer snow plow that they put the snow gates on because the plow trucks that we have, we have both, but the plow trucks that we have, you can't put it on there because you have to be able to see what you're doing and they can't see down to the street over their hood and you know their equipment. So it's because we don't have a full arsenal, I guess I'd call it, or a full fleet of the actual maintainers like you see out in the country that we can't go do the streets with those gates that stop that. So I don't know what the solution is um, because they fly through the streets and that's why we have the odd even parking so they can whip by as quickly as possible. I don't know how they can, right, how they can not plow it shut. I'm not, I don't know what to do about that. That's why I have a tractor and I help my neighbors and I get to buy a mailbox this year because I took one out for my neighbor the other day. <laughs> That Headline news, clear your sidewalks. I'm punished in my life. I move, we adjourn. Second. Shaner. Aye. Scott. Aye. Water. Aye. O'Kane. Aye. Yep. Help your neighbor.